Welcome to Catalytic Leadership, the podcast designed to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. Here is your host, author and leadership and executive coach, Dr. William Attaway. Hey, it's William, and welcome to today's episode of the Catalytic Leadership Podcast. Each week, we tackle a topic related to the field of leadership. My goal is to ensure that you have actionable steps you can take from each episode to grow in your own leadership. I believe, like Craig Rochelle has said many times, that when a leader gets better, everybody benefits. Your team, your department, your customers, your clients, your spouse, your kids, everybody. Each week, we spotlight leaders from a variety of fields, locations, and organizations. My goal is for you to see that leaders can be catalytic no matter where they are or what they lead. I draw inspiration from the stories and journeys of these leaders, and I hear from many of you that you do too. Let's jump in to today's interview. It's such an honor today to have Michael Anderson on the show. Michael has a striking combination that creates truly impactful transformation in leaders. He has the real-life business success of founding, scaling, and exiting three software companies, plus the educational background of a master's degree in psychology. This combination gives him the unique ability to connect to other leaders as a peer, then teaches evidence-based leadership skills that genuinely drive behavior and performance. Companies like Uber, Microsoft, Salesforce, and PwC bring him up to level up their leaders. Mike, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thanks, William. I I say I have a lot to talk about leadership because I've screwed a lot up. So, you know... Join the club. We got t-shirts made. <laughs> oh, good, good. Let's talk about everything not to do, everybody. So get your pens out. Yeah. yeah. Mike, I would love for you to share some of your story with our listeners, uh, particularly around your journey and your development as a leader. How did you get started? Yeah, you know, I, I started as a programmer. Uh, I was pretty good technically. Um, I, wor- wor- I um, you know, worked my way up the corporate ladder. Uh, you know, I'm intelligent. I'm hard. I'm, I'm driven. I, I'll work hard to, to figure things out. And then um, I founded my first software company in California, and we had some success right away. Where all of a sudden, you know, I'm in my mid 30s. We have a fairly big team, and I realized that I was good at business and I was a good manager, but I, I was failing as a leader. Mm. Um, I, uh, they were people, we had a big enough team. They were looking to me for, you know, a purpose and vision and culture. And I, and I knew intellectually what they, what that, um, was, but I didn't know how to get there. Yeah. And, um, and it caused a lot of problems for me. I, you know, I'll give you my, my <laughs> medium story because, <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I was, <laughs> I, I was going through a divorce. I was, um, doing a lot of alcohol and hard drugs, a lot of substance abuse, because I just, I, I was totally out of my depth. Um, you know, we were, I was, we were doing, you know, after like a two, one or two years um, in business, we we're doing a couple million dollars in revenue. I had payroll in hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I had no mentors. I was, I, I felt like such a fraud. And mm. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I don't even know how to handle any of this. I don't even know what to do tomorrow. And I was just trying to keep it all together, but I was so afraid to um, let anybody know that Mm. that it's like I was working so hard to put this mask on. Um, And, you know, that led to a lot of the substance abuse was getting worse, blah, blah, blah. Then I had a business partner, a key employee who I gave some equity to, and we, um, we had a disagreement and he had substance abuse issues too. And, you know, two substance abuse issue people with a lot of stress is not a good, not a good thing. You're talking about catalytic leadership. This is a catalytic uh, experience. And we got into a disagreement. He assaulted me. He hit me in the middle of our office. Um, So the next day I had an armed guard handing him a restraining order and a copy of a lawsuit to dissolve the partnership. And um, I went to a depression and um, it was the hardest time of my life. Um, He started a competitor and started poaching employees and customers. We, I I spent, dude, I spent so much money in legal fees. It's, it's not even, it's crazy when I think about it. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm like, I got to change my life. And so I ended up, um, I was part of a business owner group and a couple of the business owners just had some real peace about them. And mm-hmm. 
that's one thing I never had in my life was peace. And these two guys specifically had um, earned a master's degree in spiritual psychology. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And so I, at first I was like, what the heck is that? And then as I got to know them, like, I, I gotta, I gotta fix myself somehow. And, and I've never had any sense of spirituality or psychology. So I'm like, I'm going to, I, I get this might, might just do it. So I signed up and um, it was really life-changing. Now, when I say spiritual psychology has nothing to do with religion, it's, it's, it's a very compassionate, we learn six different psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis techniques, all from a place of compassion. So we learned mm. NLP, psychosynthesis, gestalt. And um, it really, it changed my life, my personal, changed me personally 180 degrees. But when I started applying what I learned them to my businesses, because once at one time I, I, I owned three, we really started to have success. Because I was connecting to my employees, I, you know, I was leading with empathy. I knew who I was. I finally yeah. found out. People ask me, I know I'm giving you a long story. And we're, we'll get into some of the questions. Great, but, yeah. Um, yeah. I think if it frames it. Because um, I finally got to know who I was. And not just know who I was, but like myself and accept myself. Yeah. Um, and I think with leaders, um, I see a lot of pe- leaders, they don't really know who they are. And then that causes issues with authenticity and vulnerability. Yeah. So people really never trust them. So um, anyway, my business has started to, to really take off. We were on the list on the Inc. 5000 list a couple of years in a row. We were voted the number one best place to work. And I won Social Entrepreneur of the Year. Wow. That was externally, but internally, I was finally having fun because up until then, leadership was one just one massive ball of stress and, and self-doubt. So- yeah, that's my, that's my simple story. <laughs> what a what a journey. <laughs> I mean, if you had if, if you had somebody had told you this was what your story was going to look like at the beginning, would you believe that? No, no, that's, that's interesting. I I I um yeah, you know, the first part of my life was just trying to hold on, I feel like mm. and, and it's it's so much easier, so much more lovely. And um and I think, you know, leadership is can be really, really difficult, really difficult mentally, emotionally, and, and you might say spiritually, too. And sure. Um, sure. Yeah, it's 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 nice when you figure some of that out. So I'm not familiar with spiritual psychology. I, I would love to hear just a little bit more about that and what you found in that that made such a difference for you. Yeah, it was it was, re- it was really cool uh, because there was a lot of psychologists that would take our they'd be doctors in psychology and they'd come back and take our program because they wanted to fall back in love with the with with the with psychology because sure. psychology can get very like people are broke let's fix them yeah and what the this what this program taught was look we're all humans we're going through this experience that all these are opportunities for growth hmm. and we take the assumption that we're all love you know our, our core <laughs> is love we, we, and is a little bit of a, a side note. We don't say you ever love anybody. We, you see the love that you already are reflected in them. Mm, mm, and okay. which is an yeah. interesting philosophical thing. But, um, <laughs> and, you know, and, the, and, uh, and then if you ha- experience something that's not love, if you experience self doubt or anger, the first thing is we all do, because we're humans, you know, that that's part of the human experience. So don't mm-hmm. judge that. Yeah. But that is an opportunity because if you have that, that then you have psychological unresolved issues in there. And so we use psychology to clear up, you know, the crap, technical term crap. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's in between you and your true self, because if we're yeah. love and we have non-loving thoughts or whatever, that just means, you know, there, that's an opportunity to heal. And once we heal them, we're in line, more in line with our true self or a soul, if you choose to believe be, believe you have a soul. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 there's so much there that I would love to just spend a whole lot of time unpacking, <laughs> but I, I, I really want to dive into leadership because that's why we're here. You you have a new book that is out, Leadership Mindset. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that, that's it's like what I you know I, it took me maybe a decade to really truly change, and you know I did it through that program and did it through, cause I, I really didn't have good, great leadership mentors. Uh-huh. So I got mentors, I hired coaches, I had mentors. I got, I, you know, I read books, I, I, you know, went through training. Um, and there's a lot out there about management and like people will talk about imposter syndrome or, mm-hmm. but, but what do you really right. do about it? And you might read a blog post or here's three things to do, but they don't really, to me, psychology and neuroscience. I, I went to get a neuroscience certificate too. There's so much now that we know about the brain and how, we think and how we work 
um, that helped me so much. And, and I work with other leaders now that can really shorten that. And, and to me, you know, great leadership, great, leaders have presence, they have confidence, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's never been an insecure leader that people are like, I want to follow that, that person. Right, right. Um, people are attracted to confidence because they want to go on a trip yeah. and they want you to take them there. And, and it's, and then, so you really need to know who you are and you have to, to, to embrace that. Yeah. Um, and th- and we can get there through um, changing how we think and changing our beliefs and changing our habits. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of the stuff that I found is talked about, but not often taught. And so I break that down into teaching people. Here's why and how we think the way we do. And here's how you can change your thinking and thought patterns and beliefs. And so mm. that's what the book's Leadership Mindset 2.0, the psychology and neuroscience of reaching your full potential as a leader. Mm. Um, and I just, it's the same journey that I went through. And I, I find it so fun to help other people hopefully not have to do hard drugs or get divorced or get hit by their business partner before they figure it out. Yeah, right. That's brilliant. I, you know, I talk a lot about helping other people to avoid the ditches that we've driven into. You know, I'm, I'm not going to live long enough to make every mistake myself. Mm. I'd like to learn from other people. And I love that you're sharing from your own experience, your own story, some things so that other people can avoid those ditches. So Based on your experience and what you've learned, how would you define leadership, Mike? Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. And I I like catalytic leadership because you talk about change and action. And I I, I just, that's sort of a side note. I I love that you you did that because I think that, you know, leadership, we're always changing, we're always moving. And if I, and I'd love to know what you think of this this definition because people, you know, say this. I I think leadership is getting people moving in a direction. Yeah. Because- You know, you can lead a movement which has not, nothing to do with specifics, or yeah. you can lead like a project team that has to do with specifics. So, yeah. I, I wanted to keep it general. That's my so that's 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 my definition, and there 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 might be holes in that or something, but that's how I think of leadership. No, I think that's brilliant, and I think you know it lines right up with something again that I, I say a lot. That is, leadership is not about getting things done. Leadership is about getting things done through other people. Yes. It's catalyzing people together to accomplish something. And I think that's, that's the task and the goal and the privilege of a leader to be able to do that. So that, that lines right up. I love that. Looking at your own journey, is there one change that you can point to in your life or your leadership that really moved the needle? Yeah. I, I, I briefly mentioned it, but you know, it's, it's worth talking about. It's, it's like, I got to, I get to, I get to know, like, and and, and trust myself. And mm, that's good. because I realized, you know, I was, I was young, had some six success early. I worked for this corporation and I, I had two bosses, Bruce and George. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here's me in my late twenties, early thirties and thirties, you know, really cool guys that, that, you know, had confidence. And so I would, I would try to like talk like Bruce talked or run a, run a meeting like George run a meeting. Of yeah. course it failed because I'm not Bruce and I'm not George. I, right. I wasn't being authentic. And, right. and, um, and so what I, as I matured and as I tried things out, I realized that, well, why is Bruce Chalk talking like that? Or why is George running a meeting like that? And I, I, I would understand why they were doing things, but then I realized, you know, who I am. And it's like, I would accomplish those, those same things through my style. Yes. And, and, you know, I, I know that, you don't have to be some tall, loud guy. You know, I'm six, eight. You don't have to be some tall, tall, loud guy. You can be a, you know, a 80 year old, really soft spoken women who I know who are an amazing leader. So it's not about anything like that, but it's about, you know, having that really knowing who you are and, and living in that. Hmm. Um, you know, some leaders are great public speakers. Some don't do that at all. Some are highly technical, some aren't, but I think the the, the great leaders really know who they are and they're not afraid to, to show that to you. And that's really attractive to people because if you know who you are, then then they're going to know who you are and then they can trust you because um, you're being authentic and vulnerable, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think it tracks, it definitely tracks with my own experience and with so many of the leaders that I've worked with and coached over the years. You know, at the beginning, we we try to to copy or emulate leaders that we admire right? People that we have watched lead us. And over time, if we don't drift away from that, what we end up becoming is a bad copy of a good leader or even a bad (laughs) copy of a great leader instead of leading out of our own self, our own authentic self. 
learning to discover your own wiring is one of the things that I'll talk about a lot because I think that's important to lead from who you are, not from somebody else that you admire or from who you think you ought to be. Yes, that last one was really because I, I I I was <laughs> I was really successful because I was deeply insecure and I wanted to be accepted. And <laughs> yeah. when I, you know, I, I really I was goofy and awkward growing up. And then I found by using my brain in work, I was a bit accepted because I was doing a good job. And I and yeah. that sort of gave me in, in a way a little bit of a tribe and a sense of belonging. But then I I I didn't it took me a while to make that next shift to being comfortable of who I was and not trying to be who I thought other people wanted me to be. Mm, that's such a trap. And I think a lot of leaders get stuck there. Is that where you see most leaders getting stuck? Yes. Yes. I, I see. I have a, in the book, I have a, a core principle that says your leadership is a reflection of the relationship with yourself. Hmm. Hmm. That's worth writing down. <laughs> yeah, so I'll say it once again for everybody out there. Your leadership is a reflection of your relationship with yourself. There's a concept in psychology. It's called a projection, which means um, everything in your life is, re is a reflection of how you feel mm. internally. So if you're angry internally at yourself or, you know, your parents or, you know, your, your, your God or whoever it is, then you're angry with your coworkers or your kids or whatever, you, you know, are, are internal. And this leadership's no differently. If, if you don't really trust yourself as a leader, you know, you might be going through the motions and make it look like you trust it. But if you don't really trust yourself, then people are going to like be like, ah, there's something about him or her I don't trust. Yeah. Because they're going to know something's off. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you don't really believe in your team, they're not going to really believe in themselves. You know, yeah. people are really zoned in intuitively. Um, and so we really have to work. I, I tell people I work on, I help them work on the relationship with themselves mm -hmm. because when we can come into a, a strong, compassionate relationship with ourselves, then we can, yeah. then we can take risks. Then we can be bold. Then we can get an action, lead change. Um, and that's really where real resilience comes from is really having faith of in yourself. And when I say faith, it's not to get everything right. It's if we do screw stuff up. Mm -hmm. I'm smart enough and and and, re and resourceful enough to get things back on track. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a bit of a difference. As a great leader, you don't even have to know what your next step is. You just need to know that you and your team are going to get you get you there. Mm. Um, but that takes a lot of self esteem and self confidence. And that feels like resilience, like leadership resilience. Yes, yes. And I think resilience, self esteem, self confidence, and self worth are all. Are, are are all Venn diagrams that overlap. Yeah, <laughs> you know that's what good. I mean? That's good. If you, have, if you have a couple of them, then you have the other. I mean, you can't have true resilience unless you really have self-esteem and self-confidence yeah. and self-worth. Um, and, uh, and you know, they're not, they're, those are things that sometimes take a little bit of time to develop, but they're definitely, th you know, muscles you can strengthen. Yeah. Do you, do you find that a lot of leaders have similar blind spots? Are there, are there certain blind spots that most leaders seem to have that they're just, well, completely unaware of? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, uh, imposter syndrome, I, I, I was doing a YP facilitating a YPO, um, forum and there was eight business owners, two of them owned businesses that were doing over $2 billion a year. Mm. And the one, started that himself. So he was the whole way through. The other was a CEO brought in and they still could feel out of place and doubt <laughs> themselves and feel like imposters and frauds. So, yeah. um, and a lot of people, and, and another guy, he was worth hundreds of millions of dollars and he woke up every day scared that he was going to uh, um, lose everything that day. Mm. You know, nothing in the world could happen that he would lose everything, you know, but he would right. wake up and be driven and, you know, you can be driven by negativity, you know, that and some, there's some people very successful. But, you know, do you really want to go through your whole life driven by fear of being yeah. poor at the end of the day when it's irrational? That's that's a tough way to go through life. I think a lot of people are driven by fear. I think fear is is something that drives, you know, not just leaders, but a whole lot of people in our culture, in our society. But when leaders exhibit it, that's a different problem because now other people are going to follow that. Yes. And, and I believe anytime, you know, I see some people that may be work for a nonprofit and, and they're doing 
really admirable things, but they're like, it, it, they just have this negativity to them. It's like, oh, I, I just do this because I hate this and I hate this. Well, why do you do that that same thing? Because you love, you know, instead of hating that so many people are hung, you know, are, are hungry, why don't you love the fact that you're feeding people? And it's, yeah. you can do the same thing with different energy. Um, and, it, you, you know, it just changes so much about how, you know, things show up. And I find people that are driven by positivity have a lot less drama are a lot easier to connect with, have deeper connections, you know, yeah. so it's, it's practical use too. Are there, are there ways that leaders can work on becoming more strategic things that they can intentionally do or habits or, or even a mindset that they can work on? Yeah, absolutely. Cause I, you know, I, most, you know, 99% of leaders, um, they were good tactically. So they get yeah. promoted. So it's like, Hey, you're good at yeah. doing stuff. So let's, make you not do stuff anymore and have you lead people. And then they're like, <laughs> well, I want to do stuff. And then their ego is like something happens with their, their, their team. And they're like, Oh, let me go fix it. Cause it makes me feel really good. And they get the dopamine. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> oh my, that sounded very uh, purposeful and personal there. I think I felt that one. <laughs> and I think a whole lot of leaders are going to feel that one too. I, I get it. I get it. Cause you know, I'm, I, uh, yeah. And, and it's, it's funny and it's, so there, there's a couple things, but you know, you got to realize if you're a leader, you, you had success by being a doer. So your brain is always going to go back to, if a problem happens, it's going to go back to how did I have success? And it's going to, yeah. so you have this, these neuro pathways that you're a problem solver. So you have to consciously um, stop that, <laughs> you know, our neuro pathways, you know, my Australian buddy said, like, like if you go through the Australian outback, the bush, you know, you have this path going, you know, wiggling around and you want, that's the way you're, 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 you think, cause it, you know, it's the easiest way. And if you want like a new path, you got to like chop it down yeah. and then start going that way, you know, over and over and over. And then the other path will grow up. It's sort of like our thought patterns. Um, that's good. And so, you know, you have to realize that you're going to be strategic. So, if the, if the what I would just tell people they're trying to be strategic is just you know maybe once a week just set an hour aside and go for a walk outside without your cell phone because mm. um, a lot of strategic thinking is reflective and and if you are leading a team you know if you just get promoted you probably are doing some tactical stuff and have a lot of pressures mm. but you really need to just take time out. And just by taking a walk around a strategic walk with no, you know, you can say, Hey, I just, I'm going to think about my personnel or I'm going to think about, you know, this customer, um, or I'm just going to think about what to do next and sort of just set the intention, let your mind rent. And I'll, for the first 20 minutes, it's just going to probably race and race and race. But after about 20, 25 minutes, it's going to be like, all right, I let go of all that stuff. And then you're going to get some insights. And those are strategic mm -hmm. insights that mm -hmm. are, that if you're at your desk, um, doing emails and, and, and meetings, you're never going to get those insights until you can, um, you know, shift, shift, your, shift your brain. There's neurological, there's brain waves. There's all these different things that need to shift mm. um, out of like the doing mode. That's brilliant. And it resonates so deeply with what I do because often I'm, I'm writing or I'm trying to think through a problem. I get stuck and I'll go for a walk, just like you said. And I find in the middle of that walk, Okay, I'm able to let it go. Yes. And then when I get back to my desk, all of a sudden there's the answer or there's the next step or there's the next phrase or word or, or thought that would never, ever have happened had I not taken that break. Yes. I love that. Yes. Mike, what is your favorite part of leadership? I love seeing people get it. I love you know, coaching people and putting them, you know, it's like, if any, anybody asks you like who is if you're if you're ever into sports like who is your favorite coach it's normally the it's normally one of the harder coaches that you've had and that yeah. tested you you know yeah. and like and I I like I think as a leader I like testing people give them a little more than they think they can handle mm. and um, seeing them mm. seeing them struggle a little bit but then that's when good. they get it and you know sometimes that's giving them a hug and sometimes I was giving them a kick, but you know, it depends on what's needed, but you know, sometimes it's one, one day and one the other day. And when they start to, when I challenge them and then they, they achieve something that they didn't think they could do and, and seeing them with that renewed sense of confidence, to me, that's the most fulfilling thing in, in leadership is, is seeing is celebrating as a team where the team sucked it up, learned new mm -hmm. skills, went out of their comfort zone 
and and really and came together. Um, to me, that that's the most rewarding thing in, in leadership. You you have sold three businesses. I would I would venture to say that most of our listeners do not have that experience. What is that like? Oh, well, it, it sounds really exciting, but there's a lot of like Zoom meetings where you're just going through a lot of you know, 40 <laughs> pages of contracts. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's, it's like a lot of things else. It, it's, 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 and it's an emotional journey because, mm. you know, you know, my, my, I love what I do and, and um, my businesses are like part of me. And then, yeah. And then I'm, I'm bringing it back to a transaction and, the, and then I'm like, oh, are they going to treat my people good or my products good? And, yes. you know, it's not my, you know, there's only so much responsibility I have. And, and you know, I do, I've always made sure everybody landed well, but, um, and, um, but it, it, it was a real emotional journey and um, it was really good uh, practice for looking at, for keeping a leadership mindset because, mm. Um, you know, in every time I've sold a business, like a day before it was going to get signed, something came up where we thought we were going to cancel the thing. Mm. And, you know, normally you're working on this six months or a year. And then all wow. of a sudden it looks like you're going to have to start over. Everything's going out the window. So, oh. you know, talking about resilience, it's like, all right, everybody <laughs> calm down. You know, the other side, the attorneys, all right, let's get back together. It's, 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 um, it's very intense and very rewarding. And, but, if you if if people you know start a business and then grow it for you know a decade or or, or more, it's going to take months to let go of that identity yeah. once they sell it. it. It's it's um you know if anybody ever wants to contact me, I can tell them more about that. But it's it's not just you sell it and you go. You, I I know all my friends are business owners and none of them ever said, oh I I sold that business and haven't thought about it since. No nobody's ever sold that. So it's not. That, that's interesting because I find so many leaders are tied up. Their identity is tied up in what they do. Is there is there is there something you can say? Hey, this is something you need to be thinking about. You know, as you're leading with regard to that. Yeah, I mean, well, identity is an interesting thing to bring up because you know we do create these identities for ourselves, and sometimes they can help us with our resilience and our yeah. leadership because we play into. The psychosynthesis talks a lot about that. And, and there, that's a psychology um, technique, psychoanalysis technique, where you actually create different avatars of yourself. And, hey, I need to be more, um, uh, you know, brave. So I have, you know, brave Michael. And I think about that and I, I move into him or I need to be more compassionate and listen. So I have listening, hmm. Michael. So you can actually do that with yourself and create that to, to call upon them. Hmm. Um where identities are a problem is when they're not serving you. And so, um, mm. you know, you could, you know, maybe it, it's, you, you might be a bit macho or something like that. Oh, I grew up, you know, this way, or this is how a man acts or a woman acts or this yeah. acts or that acts. And, you know, it, it's, so we got to be very careful with our, with our uh, identities and where we overplay into them, because that also takes us a bit out of being present is one it can, mm is when we're in these identities. So there, there are things you got to be really cautious of when you deploy them. That's fascinating. Yeah. You you love to write, you love to read like most yeah. leaders and you love to learn. And I can, I mean, just in the time we've spent together, I can tell that, that you're a continual <laughs> learner. Is there a book that has made a big difference in your life that you would say, man, you know, if a leader, if a leader wants their next read, this is one they should pick up. Oof. If so, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you one. It's probably not going to be one <laughs> that uh, <laughs> normally gets called The Surrender Experiment. The Surrender mm -hmm. Experiment by um, Michael Singer. Okay. And um, he's a guy, and I'm not going to give it, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you what it's about, and, you're, and I'm probably not going to give it justice. But he was basically some guy, I think he lived in Florida, and he was a teenager. He had a lot of angst, and he started meditating. And meditating, he really loved meditation. So he just, all he did was want to meditate, but then different things started happening in his life. And he's like, I don't really want to do this. I just want to meditate, but I'm going to say yes, yes to life more or less. Mm. And he is, I'm not going to tell you exactly. And, and what he, he talks about surrender from like the spiritual perspective. I'm, I'm not going to try to control things. I'm just going to surrender to what life gives me. And, mm. and, um, and <laughs> so I, I would just tell you, he started out as like a shoeless hippie. 
uh, with pretty much nothing. And he has got a doctor's degree, had written a best-selling, one best-selling book when he was a kid. He ended up being CEO of a public software company. Wow. He's been on Oprah, I believe, and we worked with Tony Robbins, and he's one of the top spiritual people. But And it talks about, and he, this is a story of his life. It's a good audio book. I really like listening. I've listened to it a couple of times. And just about how, you know, I think as, as leaders, we're often good controllers. We yeah. want to control everything. And, sure. you know, we're salespeople or whatever. Sometimes that's important. But there's other times where we just try to control things way too much. And if we just let go and just trust, yeah. and there's so much, you know, there can be so much more there when we're just in this state of flow. And that doesn't mean being weak or anything, but that means like going in with your eyes open. What opportunities are there? How can I how can I let go of this, all this perceived control and just live presently and in the flow of life? Um, yeah. So that, that, that's my William, the surrender experiment, a bit of a, yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of that. And you intrigued me with it. Now I want to check it out. <laughs> cool. Cool. That sounds cool. incredibly helpful. What about you? I'm doing all this talk. William. You're, you're, you're an interesting <laughs> dude. I want to hear your book. What's your, what's one book I should put on my list? Did you, you know, I think you're the first person to ask me that in, in reverse. That's brilliant, man. There's, there, there are, I have a book problem you can see behind me. I, I, there are so many good books that that have made such a difference in my journey. Um, you know, I think I think on a on a tactical level, uh, Patrick Lencioni's books have been incredibly helpful. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, yeah. leadership parable writer. Uh, he will write the parable for the first three fourths of the book and then unpack it. And uh, his book, Death by Meeting, really changed the way that I think about and lead meetings now, uh, whether virtual or in person. Uh, brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, his his most recent is uh, Working Genius, the six types of working genius, that every one of us have areas that we are, well, a genius in. We have areas that we are competent in, and we have areas that frustrate us. And the key is knowing the genius, competency, and frustration points of each person on your team that you work closely with so that you can lean the synergy of your team as much as possible into the areas of genius for each team member. And uh, man, so, so powerful. I love that. Love that mindset. I love that that tool. I've been using that with our team now for a couple of years, and I'm coaching leaders in, in helping them to leverage that. I mean, every tool is just that. It's a tool. Are we going to use it to accomplish what it is that we do in a better way? That's that's the question. So thanks for the question. Those, those are two that have made a big difference for me. Well, that's cool. And, you know, I, I think a great leader puts people in positions to succeed. And, and I think yeah. we can get in that leadership trap to put somebody with the wrong personality in you yeah. don't want to put a salesperson doing accounting, obviously. You want to, yeah. somebody who, you know, people love accounting because people love sales or, you know, talking to people. And I think it's, you know, we got to be careful not to just fit, you know, what a, a square peg into a round hole type of thing. And that seems like a great, I'm a, I'll check that out. I love Patrick. He, it's so easy to read. His his yeah. stuff is like, it's just a pleasure to read. He's, he's, he's really great that way. It is. Mark Miller is another, another guy. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Uh, he was uh, vice president of, I think, leadership development or training or something at Chick-fil-A and uh, has written a number of books, similar style, uh, but unpacking principles uh, in story form. And uh, he's, I think, seven, eight, nine books now uh, out. Uh, but each one that comes out, I think, uh, man, that's really good. Uh, so another author that uh, that I've really benefited a lot from. So oh, anyway, this is not about me. This is about down. you. <laughs> I know our listeners are going to want to stay connected with you, Mike. What is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So my name is Michael Anderson, but I put my first initials R and because you can't Google Michael Anderson. So if you ever want to get in touch with me, it's R Michael Anderson for Robert, R Michael Anderson.com. Um, and if you're interested in leadership mindset, you can just go to leadership mindset, the book.com leadership mindset, the book.com. Um, and, you know, if you ever struggle with imposter syndrome, if you want to move from tactical to strategic, mm -hmm. if you want to uh, engage, get it, get a great engaged team with an amazing culture. And, you know, you, you like to up level your mindset that this, that that's really what this, the, the book's written for. That's brilliant. I can't wait to dive into this and learn more from you through the book and through staying connected. 
Thank you so much for the generosity you've shown today, Mike. I mean, sharing so much of your experience and your insights with our listeners. So much value here. Thanks, William. Thanks for having me on, and and, and thanks for your your cat. Thanks for being the catalyst. Thanks for joining me for this episode today. As we wrap up, I have a couple of requests for you. I'd love for you to do two things. First, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you find value here, I'd love it if you would rate it and review it. That really does make a difference in helping other people to find this podcast. Second, if you don't have a copy of my newest book, Catalytic Leadership, I'd love to put a copy in your hands. If you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, you can get a copy for free. Just pay the shipping so I can get it to you, and we'll get one right out. My goal is to put this into the hands of as many leaders as possible. This book captures principles that I've learned in 20 plus years of coaching leaders in the entrepreneurial space, in business, government, nonprofits, education, and the local church. You can always connect with me on LinkedIn to keep up with what I'm learning and thinking about. And if you're ready to take a next step with a coach who can help you to intentionally grow and thrive as a leader, I'd be honored to help you. Just go to catalyticleadership.net to book a call with me. And stay tuned for our next episode next week. Until then, as always, leaders, choose to be catalytic. Thanks for listening to Catalytic Leadership with Dr. William Attaway. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Want more? Go to catalyticleadership.net. Dot net.